start. Okay. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dearest guest, I would like to introduce you to our team. I'll be the moderator of today's lecture. My name is Nana Tchanchalashvili. I recently graduated from neurosurgical training uh, from West Georgia Medical Center, and currently I'm doing an internship at University Hospital of Bordeaux. These online educational meetings have started with Professor Hassan Kamal Sujo, the program manager of uh, the neurosurgery department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in Turkey, and goes on with the contribution of all the residents, also with the contribution of neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department. Uh, also, neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries like Bulgaria, Georgia, and Pakistan. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid the, uh, the voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions not by turning on your microphones, but by writing to the uh, chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturers and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meeting. Please do not ask your microphones to be turned on. Uh, Professor Joanna Zakraska, uh, so she has obtained the den uh, dental degree from King's College, London, and uh, her medical degree from Cambridge University and um, he has a specialty training uh, in uh, oral medicine. Uh, and in a, to, uh, between the years 2007 and 2015, she developed uh, and ran the largest award-winning UK Center for Special Pain, which is integrated with other disciplines across UCLH. It's uh, the largest UK center with multidisciplinary management of trigeminal neuralgia, which is enabling uh, Professor Zakreska to set up a national institute for trigeminal neuralgia. She is also a part of the team uh, at the Pain Management Center. She has written six books in, uh, for trigeminal neurology, contributed chapters to 29 books, and has written over 200 peer-reviewed papers, and has lectured in over 30 countries, as well as lecturing nationally. She has been rated as the top research expert in trigeminal neurology in the world. She is a chairperson of the Medical Advisory Board and the founder of Trust of Trigeminal Neurology Association of UK. And I would also like to add that uh, uh, I had a subspecialty training in uh, uh, UCLH hospitals and had an honor to work with her in person. And uh, we had a research project which hopefully will be published soon. So we uh, already had hosted uh, two lectures. Uh, and I, I have hosted two lectures for trigeminal neurology, and one of them was more like surgical, and another one with Professor Mojkan Hode, it was more like uh, radiological, so um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Professor Joanna Zakraska will summarize everything and will uh, kind of summarize the topic of trigeminal neuralgia. Professor Zakraska, you are welcome to start the meeting. Screen right. sharing. Okay, so hopefully can screen, share my screen. Is that visible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, uh, slide show. From the beginning. Right. Okay. So thank you very much for this uh, invitation um, and for an ability to talk to uh, more neurosurgical um, fraternity than uh, more my pain group. So as an overview, I'm going to cover these areas a little bit on epidemiology, classification and why it's so important that this is correct. Uh, key features, which again is so crucial before any surgery is done. The importance of understanding the impact of trigeminal neuralgia and how pain relief isn't the only outcome. I want to spend quite a bit of time on outcomes because it's the work of my PhD student at the moment. Um, and then talk about guidelines, European guidelines particularly, that we have now uh, started up and uh, about the support uh, that patients want. And so I'm really going to concentrate on what the patients uh, feel about this because I've worked very closely with them. Just as a reminder, I'm going to go into this in much greater detail, but those of you just as a quick reminder, Trigeminal neuralgia has got to be in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve, described as electric type pain, rapid attacks of pain with high intensity remission periods, provoked by light touch activities. On examination, may find some sensory changes, often, again, being from the oral world in the past, uh, examination of the mouth will show you that this which side this patient's got uh, her trigeminal neuralgia, and you may also witness uh, an attack uh, oh, yeah. in your Professor, clinic. Uh, 
we see your presentation in a presenter mode. Uh, we see the next slide and the writings. Thank ah, you. right. Okay, let me go back. Uh, right. Uh, thanks for the warning. I'll go back screen sharing. Let me stop the share and start again. Um, and choose the appropriate one. So it'll be that one. Then screen two, share. Right. Is that better now? Perfect. Right. Okay. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> Uh, right, so, oh, wait a minute, no, let me just see if I can move on now, wait a minute, I've now lost my uh, way of moving, wait a minute, ah, oh, right, okay, uh, can't see my other screen, but never mind, that's fine, epidemiology then, so, um, what is unusual, wait a minute, uh, I got another, yeah, okay, uh, sorry, I'll go back. Right, so trigeminal neuralgia is a very unique, is it a condition or is it a diagnosis? Because it is relatively rare. What is incredible about the trigeminal nerve is its ability to adapt, uh, its plasticity. If we think about it, we all lose our baby teeth. Every one of those teeth has a bit of trigeminal nerve attached to it. Why don't we get neuropathic pain? We do a lot of surgery, the dental fraternity particularly, trauma. Uh, why don't we get more neuropathic uh, pain? It's also rare for patients with trigeminal neuralgia to report other chronic pain. A lot of other patients with chronic pain have pain in all sorts of different parts of the body, but not this group. It's episodic with remission periods and also responds very specifically to sodium channel blockers. And really surgery results in much better outcomes than anything we can achieve on the physician's front. So how many cases are there? Well, this still remains a very difficult question to answer. Uh, in the UK, it's been estimated between 2,800 uh, per year new cases with a prevalence of 0.7. There are very few studies uh, carried out, particularly in the population. In fact, national, internationally, only three. Uh, its peak, though, is in the older age group, more females, just slightly. And we do know that one of the major risk factors is multiple sclerosis. So uh, a few years back, back in 2006, there was an examination of the primary care uh, electronic records uh, throughout the UK because the NHS obviously collects quite a substantial amount of data. And they looked at, among other things, trigeminal neuralgia uh, and found a much higher prevalence than that uh, in um, reported that I've just shown. And we have now managed to get uh, a grant to relook at this data, not just in using the primary care data, but also hospital data. So that means those patients with an ICD-10 code of G50 being referred into the hospital, what happens to them in the hospital, how many of them have surgery, which type of surgery they have, potentially how many are just in there for rehydration or uh, better ma medical management. We'll also have access to mortality data and potentially mental health data, because that could tell us whether there's a higher instance, which I'll mention uh, about suicide. So this is uh, a study we're just about to start. Uh, it's going to be done by a large uh, and data analysts who can handle, as they call it, big data. So in a year's time, I hope to be able to give you a better picture of at least in the UK, what the epidemiology of this condition is. So let's have a look at classification because a lot of work's gone into this recently. And we've got two varying classifications. There's a third one, which I'll allude to in a moment. So the International Headache Society, the ICHD one, and there's the IASP, which is the International Association for the Study of Pain. Now, the headache fraternity have divided it up into classical trigeminal neuralgia, where you see a neurovascular compression, classical TN with concomitant persistent facial pain. So there is a background of some pain. There's painful trigeminal neuralgia attributed to MS, attributed to space occupying lesions, or not known about other disorders. Whereas the international 
Association for the Study of Pain tries to make it a little bit simpler by calling classical neurovascular compression, idiopathic no compression, and secondary fit in with all the others. And then the particular group of ICOP, uh, which is the International Classification for Orofacial Pain, have again divided it similarly again. So we have the classic trigeminal neuralgia, but purely paroxysmal or with concomitant continuous pain, the same secondary and divided it into the multiple sclerosis ones, space occupying lesions and other causes such as AV malformations and the idiopathic, which again divided into purely paroxysmal and concomitant in whom we really don't know what is causing uh, this. And so this led to a group to try and combine these um, and Crucio et al, we published this back in 2016. Um, so the first thing is, is this distribution in the correct trigeminal territory and is it paroxysmal? So we then call it a possible TN. Then if we find that it is triggered by light touch, then we can call it clinically established TN, probable neuropathic pain. And then the MRI is the investigating, gives us the confirmatory uh, diagnosis. So if there's no neurovascular compression, you go into the idiopathic group. And then the others are the classics, as we've said, with showing neurovascular compression on MRI scan and the others, which are all the other secondary ones. And I think that's the basic one that's um, enough there, uh, that we have really idiopathic, classical and secondary. So let's now look at the key features in a little bit more detail. Um, and we as physicians spend a lot of time going through the story uh, and picking up uh, the diagnosis, because although there perhaps are five key questions you need, but you need to delve in a little bit uh, deeper into this, particularly if you're going to be doing surgery. Um, Kim Birchall in the States is very concerned that too many neurosurgeons are operating on patients with unilateral TMD, temporomandibular disorder, instead of trigeminal neuralgia, because they haven't taken a careful history. So, Firstly, we need to make sure that the pain is sharp, shooting, knife-like. So these two are images, in fact, created uh, by our patients and very much classical, sharp, electrical. Whereas burning no longer fits, really. It might be a bit of background pain, but if a patient's predominant pain is burning, you immediately sort of think, well, this can't be trigeminal neuralgia. Or if it's dull, and achy component, again, doesn't fit the criteria for trigeminal neuralgia. It could be a bit of the background pain, can sometimes be described as aching. Severity, very important, measured in all sorts of ways, visual analog scale, probably the best one. And what is interesting is that the first attacks very often are some of the most severe. And if you read the old historical data, um, some of the uh, neurologists describe that the very worst pain is that of the first attack. And I think that again will go into when I talk about memorable onset is that the severity is very high, particularly at the beginning. So we're looking at the pain really being episodic, not a continuous pain. We're looking at this memorable onset. So many patients, even 20 years on, can tell you what they were doing at the time of their first attack of pain. It's an acute, sudden onset. And in fact, some of the surgical literature reports that the prognosis of patients who have a memorable onset is better. And I just wonder whether that's because the diagnosis was likely to be more correct. It's a pain of abrupt onset and termination. And uh, one of my neurology colleagues says, well, I just clap uh, for the patient and say, does it feel like this? And we say that the timing is minutes, uh, is only seconds to minutes. We also recognize that there probably is a refractory period. That is a moment when you can't stimulate the pain. And the best way of eliciting that probably is through 
looking at uh, eating and you say to them, well, you can't eat, but is there a moment when suddenly you can manage to eat or brush your teeth? And that could well be what's called the refractory period. There are periods of remission and periods of relapse. Um, and that's why uh, recognizing them in the secondary care sector is often easier because you've got a longer history. It's harder in primary care with that first attack because you haven't yet got a remission period or a relapse. And it's worth getting patients to give you an idea of how long these remission periods are and how long the relapses are and are they getting worse because they don't all progress. The usual story was, oh, they all get progressively worse. Well, that's actually not true, as I'll show with some of my data. And then it's important to elucidate, is there some background pain? And what is the character of this background pain? So these are some of the diagrams that I sometimes use to draw uh, with patients uh, and to try and get them uh, to give me a better understanding of the pain. So if they draw their pain as a number seven or a number eight, then I really straight away discount it as being trigeminal neuralgia. Also, number five, where the pain is lasting for hours, is much more likely to be a cluster headache than it is a, a TN. This is a, a picture you may well see. It goes up suddenly, but it takes a little while before it goes down. The most typical is number two, rapid onset uh, um, uh, period of no pain, and then another attack of varying intensity. But when the pain is extremely severe, then they can talk about having a series of attacks. So it's a series of stabs attack that go on and on, uh, and it could be possibly looking a bit more like six as well. Uh, so very important to try and get the patients to describe it. And they don't always stay in the same pattern. So they may sometimes be one, but sometimes they may be two. And this pattern of prolonged uh, diminishing also varies. So important to check each time they come how it's changing. Distribution, you'll be well familiar with this. Um, the third, uh, second and third division are the most frequent. What I like to point out often is that the third division actually extends up here, but I have quite a number of my patients who will not report pain radiating as high up as this. Many of them will say it stops at the preauricular area. And oral pain is very frequent, which is why they often present uh, to the dentist thinking that they've got a, a very severe toothache. And then provoking factors, and these should be coming out spontaneously. You would hope that patients, you don't have to ask them specifically, that they come up with this diagnosis immediately saying, I can't eat, I can't drink. If you give me an apple, I can't eat it. I can't put in my dentures. I can't touch my face, I can't shave, I can't wash, and it's light touch, not hard touch, and the cold wind also makes it worse. The only relieving factors are sleep in the early instance. When the pain is very severe, it does wake them at night, and we think that possibly they do get attacks at night, but because they're so rapid and not of high intensity, they don't notice them. Keeping still is important. Reducing stress uh, helps uh, because fear drives even more pain and medication will, is one of the only relieving factors. Other associated factors, as I associated, those of you can have a look at the mouth, you may well see reduced oral hygiene on that side of the pain. Weight loss is very uh, common particularly if they've had a very bad bout, they will significantly lose weight. Again, you may witness an attack with that typical appearance of a tick, hence the name consultive. Some of them may have autonomic features, uh, droopy eye, red eye, runny eye, runny nose. Sometimes if they're very prominent, we talk about them having SUNA, short unilateral neuralgiform headaches with autonomic features, or if they're only present, sometimes I will label them as TN with some autonomic features. So in summary, these are the diagnostic criteria that I think we've all agreed upon. 
and these should always be quoted if you're reporting your series of patients uh, for publication or for surgery. Before you do any surgery, can I urge you to check that these criteria are fulfilled? It's absolutely crucial that you're operating on the right patients because although patients may, the problem is that patients may also learn and try and fit these criteria um, because uh, they know that surgical outcomes are better than medical outcomes. But you really need to devote some time uh, to these. So impact, and I think this is what isn't measured often enough. Um, and this is from our series of 225 patients using the brief pain inventory facial, which I'll allude to, developed by John uh, Lee, a neurosurgeon in Pittsburgh. And the dark green, as you can see, is where they're impacted. And look at those, all features that are so crucial uh, to uh, everyday living. So it affects our everyday living uh, and hence the reason why patients will um, have uh, time off work, uh, will lose weight. And again, in that same cohort, we use the hospital anxiety and depression scale, and you can see the amount of anxiety and depression. We also use the pain catastrophizing questionnaire and showed the very high instance of negative thoughts, catastrophizing, which increases their chance of feeling more pain uh, because fear will drive even more pain. So the problem is that it's unseen, uh, most people, other people sort of think, oh, well, you can't. I've had neuralgia. This isn't anything. This is a significant pain. And we have data from the veterans uh, data looking at uh, suicide uh, among patients with chronic pain. And again, you'll find a high instance of it, uh, of the facial pains or headaches. The only two that really come in significantly, as you see, are trigeminal neuralgia and cluster headache. Uh, so those two are well recognized uh, for being a potential risk for suicide. And hence the importance uh, to evaluate this. And again, surgery may be the only way forward uh, to stop this. So again, key issues, we've done some qualitative work with patients uh, and their main concerns are that there is delay in diagnosis again, misdiagnosis, side effects from medication, which is why patients are then driven to surgery quite rightly, and the lack of psychological support, because very much trigeminal neuralgia has been managed in a very medical uh, way. That is, yes, medication, surgery, that's it. And we don't give them the psychological support, which we found is crucial. So let's have a look now at outcomes, because this is an area that uh, Carolina, my PhD student, is just completing her PhD on, and which is crucial. So firstly, we talk about domains, that is, what are the areas of importance to patients? And so far, these are the ones that we as clinicians have identified as being important domains. And then we need to but we do need to look at what patients think, which are the domains that are important to patients. And then we need to see whether we have got measures that will actually measure these domains and how well validated these have been. So as we started with a PhD, we started with a literature review, a systematic review published in uh, World Neurosurgery. Uh, looking at what are the outcome measures, domains, dimensions, and measures that have been used. Um, and so we found 467 reports, mainly surgical, very few in the medical field, that reported on outcome measures. Not surprisingly, you can see that pain was the top um, outcome uh, domain that was measured. And symptoms and adverse events are also frequently reported. But when you look further down at physical functioning, participating in uh, satisfaction with treatment, emotional functioning, the way participants think about it, that is the global impression of change, 
look at the small number of studies uh, that we have here that report on things other than just pain. And of the outcome measures, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment, the main one that is used is the Barrow Neurological Institute one, which is 131 uh, surgical reports use this one. A Likert scale is just a, a one to 10 visual analog scales and a few others. And I'll give you a, a bigger brief on those. So what we found at the end of the systematic review that there was great heterogeneity in reporting of outcomes in the literature. So there was no way that you could compare medical outcomes against surgical outcomes. Also potentially that in medical outcomes, we often talk that if we get a 50% improvement, we talk about a positive outcome. Whereas in surgical outcomes, we normally expect 100%. Uh, relief of pain. So that's one of the other reasons that makes it difficult to compare medical against surgical. There is no consensus on choice of what should be the primary outcome measure. And we had a big struggle with this when we were doing a drug trial, because what was more important, intensity or frequency of pain? Uh, and this was a, a dilemma that we face, and shouldn't there be something uh, that could encompass, for instance, those two outcomes. The other very difficult uh, part is the episodic nature of TN. And can instruments capture this effect uh, on the number and treatment of TN attacks? How many of us have had good results, not because of what we've done, but because of the natural history of the disorder? There's very little on impact on the physical and emotional functioning. And yet I think these are particularly important in surgery because this is what you can through surgery achieve much better physical and emotional functioning than we can on medical management because our patients with medical management have always got fear, they're fearful, their pain will return, they're still on drugs. Whereas with surgery, you're not having to use any drugs and you can feel confident that you're free of pain. But what isn't remembered in the surgical literature is the side effects. These can impact on pain even more than just pain relief. So the patients who develop anesthesia dolorosa, significant hearing loss, uh, these can have a significant impact on people's quality of life. And these are not reported on, although as I've shown, symptoms are reported, but the impact of the side effects of these is not reported. And the big problem is that the majority of these tools haven't been psychometrically tested. So when we did our um, focus groups. Firstly, we did focus groups with patients who reported on what their outcomes were important, what domains, we're not talking about measures, we're talking about domains. And we then also had a Delphi study with all the world experts. Um, probably some of you may have been involved in this study as well. And then we also had a consensus meeting uh, through Zoom to decide on what are the mandatory outcomes. And over 70% of both patients and clinicians uh, voted that these were the mandatory outcomes. So we see here pain relief, which is the one that's been measured most frequently in surgical outcomes. But duration of pain relief is important to, to us. Pain intensity, interference of the pain, Patients will accept being pain free on medications. And that's sometimes particularly what's achieved in surgical outcomes. You get pain free, but patients still remain on some medication. But here we get some important quality of life ones. Health related quality of life is important. Ability to participate in social roles and activities, extremely important. But patients also and clinicians will talk about overall response to treatment and satisfaction with treatment is important. And again, 
side effects, both from medical and surgical treatments. So these are the important mandatory outcomes that we should be reporting on from any patients undergoing treatment for trigeminal neuralgia. We then have the other ones that didn't reach total consensus were important, but not 70% of agreement. And here we see that reducing the quality of pain, that it isn't electric-like. Interestingly, eating, talking, self-care, that is being able to wash their faces, put on makeup, uh, shave, uh, were not mandatory. But coping, fear of pain, as you see, comes here. And interestingly, particularly, this is the patients were talking about the lack of knowledge of GPs and dentists and therefore poor referral into the secondary care sector and the importance of having access to specialist clinics. So in the UK, for instance, many patients are referred through to oral surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons who really aren't experts in the field and therefore their treatment gets delayed. So patients are particularly asking that specialist clinics are set up and that these are well publicized and known. So these are the domains. So now we have to think, have we got measures that would measure these domains? So the first one that probably a lot of you are familiar with is the Barrow Neurological Institute pain scale. And that, as you see, is used very, very frequently. Now, why have I got a problem with this one? Well, firstly, it's not been psychometrically tested at all. And the first thing is, if you look at it, there are two domains that are being measured simultaneously. There is the pain aspect, and then you have the medication. Now, these are two completely different concepts. Some of our patients are so terrified that they will not stop their medication, even though they're pain-free. So suddenly, if they continue on their medication but are pain-free, they don't reach number one. And so it's very important to separate out medication use from pain. They should not be going together. The other difficulty I have with this um, scale, which has also been reviewed by John Lee in a paper he did looking at scales, is the fact that we don't know who is administering it. Is it done from the medical records? Is it the clinicians who just go through the medical notes and make a comment? Is it the neurosurgeons who are looking at it? Or is it actually patients being asked to put themselves into those categories and decide? So we never know because nobody writes it in the methodology of surgical outcomes, how this has actually been measured. Or is it just retrospective looking at the notes? So John Lee particularly set up the brief pain inventory facial. So he hijacked the brief pain inventory, which is a very well recognized inventory, well validated um, and used within the pain world. And he added seven more facial um, criteria to it. And they've been using it for a number of years, and they have published uh, on this, trying to find what is the minimally clinically important difference. So if you're administering this questionnaire at regular intervals to your patients, say a baseline before you do any surgery, and then say at three months after surgery, six months after surgery, a year after surgery, how much does it need to change to be able to say, you've had a successful treatment. What would patients say is the minimum change? For instance, do you need to drop from a 10 out of 10 pain to be down to five out of 10 and say, well, that's a very good outcome and I'm happy with that. And that's what they've been trying to do here. But again, it wasn't totally validated uh, among patients. So we took the brief pain inventory with uh, John Lee there, as you see, and we developed it with patients. So this time patients were involved in measuring the impact. So 15 uh, patients were used to create uh, this 
um, separate scale from the brief pain uh, facial, partly because the owner uh, of the brief pain inventory did not agree to that those words being used for this questionnaire. So it's become called the pen facial uh, revised. And it is 12 items. And I'll show you the 12 items here. So this is the 12 items that are on there that the patients have told us are important. And the scale is naught to 10, with naught being no interference and 10 complete interference. And here we're measuring daily activities, mood, relationships, eating a meal, biting, chewing, touching the face, self-care, brushing teeth, smiling, talking, opening wide, and temperature activities, that is if it's hot or cold. So as you see, many of the uh, domains are covered in this potential measure. And that's the next piece of research my student has to do is to now find whether patients agree that this questionnaire covers many of the domains they talked about. The important one as well that we think is important, which covers the domain of overall satisfaction, patient global impression of change. And so this is very widely used throughout the pain world and again should be adopted by all surgeons uh, doing this procedure. It's very easy scale. There are only seven uh, domains here and it's easily answered uh, by patients um, and should be used for all patients undergoing surgery. So let's have a look now a little bit at the guidelines, the recommendations. So the very first guidelines we published uh, both in the US and in Europe were in 2008. And we have updated the uh, European ones back in 2019. And I'm going to share with you some of these uh, recommendations from uh, this paper. So firstly, it's acknowledged that diagnosis is complex. It's also suggested that the teams should be multidisciplinary, include dental and medical people. And in fact, there's a paper come out from uh, Norway, which uh, suggests that neurosurgeons should have a dental person on their MDT group. GPs and dentists, at least this for the UK, is applicable. Primary care physicians could start treatment, but should be considering referral on. We must measure outcomes and we need to provide written information, potentially online resources. And for instance, in the UK, the Brain and Spine Foundation have published a booklet for facial pain pores. So it is important that patients have some written information that they can refer back to. Pain diaries uh, are useful as a way of measuring outcome. Investigations, we also talk about the importance of MRI scans really to rule out secondary causes, CT scans if MRIs are not possible, neurophysiological testing to diagnose secondary causes, particularly if your patients can't undergo an MRI scan for one reason or another. And then we have uh, the importance of neurovascular compression. Um, and uh, this is an important paper in brain talking about contact on its own is not significant. We're talking about uh, significant compression, but you had that in the last uh, lecture on imaging. So I'm not going to go into detail on that. So what are the guidelines in terms of treatment? Anything in yellow is a strong recommendation. Uh, green is weak recommendation because we haven't got enough evidence there. So as has been for many years, carbamazepine and now oxcarbazepine are strong recommendations. Lamotrigin, weak, gabapentin, weak, and uh, Botox, again, weak. Uh, we will admit that we didn't search uh, the, uh, the Chinese literature, which is huge. And then again, low evidence for pregabalin, baclofen, and phenytoin, but are options uh, that can be used uh, and potentially can be used prior to surgery. And then acute management, again, uh, 
probably phosphonitoin infusion, but they need admission. Uh, this is currently being done as a PhD uh, piece of work in Denmark um, at the Headache Center. So my tryptan might play a role for short-term relief of pain, only a small RCT from uh, the Japanese group. Um, and then lidocaine, and particularly for me coming from the dental world, local injections, particularly if the pain is triggered uh, from the lower part of the face, can give some pain relief uh, for a while until the drugs start to work. I'm not convinced about IV uh, infusions, but there are some patients who say uh, they are helpful. But the big problem with any of the drugs we use are the side effects. Uh, and this was using a, a well-validated questionnaire for picking up on side effects from anticonvulsant drugs, a group of 161 of our patients, and the severe ones are the dark blue, and you can see tiredness, memory problems, sleepiness, disturbed sleep. And this is what drives patients to surgery. They can't cope quite rightly with this level of side effects because all of them suffer side effects. We did a much more sophisticated testing using cognitive psychologists doing a, a special computer program and again showed the same cognitive impairment, sense of motor neuron function, that is their skills at navigating things which accounts for why some of these patients also have ataxia, have falls, fractures and things. So there is a lot of evidence to suggest that the current drugs we have do result in significant side effects, which the tolerability of them make patients move towards a surgical option. We've also shown uh, that, for instance, women are much more sensitive to carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, need lower doses uh, to reduce their side effects. So there is a lot of evidence for the need for new drugs. And until recently, there'd been no drugs, uh, new drugs developed. But in fact, uh, there's a new sodium channel blocker, Vixotrigen, which we have now just published the first phase two study on, on this. Um, and a large international study, uh, but it took a long time to complete. Uh, only 29 did the RCT. Generally, what we found was fewer treatment failures, but the big uh, factor was the general lack of side effects. And both clinicians and patients noticed and recognized whether they were on placebo or active drug and reported much better outcomes. So phase three trials are now needed. Um, this is a drug uh, that Biogen have, but they have at the moment halted their phase three study. But there is a fair, another drug on the market now uh, that we have just started drug trials uh, for, Drug trials have started in the US, and some of you, again, may be involved in these. We have just started in the UK. It's also going to be used in, um, in Europe as well. So there are potentially out there new drugs, but really what we're left with is surgery. So the important thing is, when should patients come and see a neurosurgeon? And this is something we've worked at quite well, uh, quite frequently with our MDT clinics, which in fact, Nana was also involved in helping us to evaluate. So we think it's time to see a neurosurgeon when you've been properly phenotyped by a physician, that you have thin cut MRIs and that potentially you have used some medication and had response to them, but you're not in extremis. And therefore, you're able to make some rational decisions, because when the pain is a 10 out of 10 and you cannot eat or drink, patients will agree to any surgical proposition that you come forward with. And that's not the right time to be thinking of outcomes. And again, I think you know this data, major surgery probably still remains around this 70% pain-free at 10 years, very low mortality now, relatively low complication, minor surgery, that's talking about all the ablative procedures uh, and uh, gamma knife, uh, not as good, but repeatable and doable in any age group with any comorbidities. 
And so in our recommendations, although there have been no randomized controlled trials or even comparative trials, the data is so strong that we are saying that microvascular decompression should be potentially the first port of call. And then stereotactic radiosurgery and ablative procedures because of their destructive element and therefore sensory changes and therefore impact on quality of life um, have got weaker recommendations. And one of the big pleas that we'd like to make again comes up with the fact, that, as you saw, the outcome measures aren't properly reported. Uh, we have uh, attempted back in now in 2013 to put forward how reports of surgical interventions should be reported because we just cannot compare one treatment against another uh, within the surgical uh, fraternity as well as with medical ones. And these were the scores that we particularly you can look up the more details, but these are the key elements and how we awarded sort of 30 points on all of this. So there had to be a good title, abstract and introduction that gave an idea of what it was. In the methods, we were particularly keen on making sure the diagnostic criteria, ICDH uh, criteria quoted as we've just gone through. There's details about the surgical technique. I have just, for instance, found out uh, that one neurosurgeon, if he finds no compression uh, while opening up for an MVD, injects a little bit of glycerol into uh, uh, the nerve. Now, where is that reported? So very much more detail on surgical techniques, outcomes that are used, which questionnaires, baseline outcomes, and then followed through uh, with follow-up and the statistical methods used. And then in the results, we definitely need full demographics, but we also need to know what was the baseline pain. There's no point in saying you've relieved pain if you haven't measured it to start with. I know we often, the surgeons make an assumption that the pain was 10 out of 10, but that's not always true. Some patients do opt for earlier surgical management because they've had severe relapses before and are terrified. So a baseline measure of pain and the outcomes uh, that are important to patients are crucial. And we should be looking at patients differently if they've had previous surgery, because that can affect outcomes. The follow-up period is crucial. Reporting a follow-up period of only one year is insufficient. We've suggested that Kaplan-Myers should be used for a minimum of three years, because we know, looking at the literature, that in MVDs, it's the first two years have got the biggest drop. And then after that, very few patients drop out. So that's why we've suggested a minimum of three-year follow-up. Complications should be both immediate complications and long-term complications um, so that we can give our patients uh, better outcomes uh, and prediction. And mortality should also be reported. So you can look at uh, that in greater detail. And we think that if any of you are writing papers up for surgical uh, procedures that you do that you should ensure that you've covered all these factors and provided details uh, for this. So what about patients themselves? Well, firstly, this is something we use significantly with all our patients attending our multidisciplinary pain clinic a decision-making tool. Now, this is the Ottawa personal decision tool. It's used in any form of uh, decisions that patients uh, have been uh, have to make. It's been well uh, supported by a Cochrane review. So it's a well-recognized decision guide. You can download it uh, for free. Uh, and what you do is what we do in our clinic. We give them the options uh, after discussion whether they stay, for instance, on medical therapy or which of the surgical options are reasonable. And then they can go away and fill this out, uh, deciding which treatment they feel is best for them. Have they got enough information? Uh, do they need to consult again? And now this will change because when they come on a day when they are well, they may well opt and say, well, no, I want to stay on medical management. But if their pain then becomes very severe, 
then they're going to relook at their decision making and decide, well, wait a minute, I do need surgery. But things like sensory loss are very, very important. And the risk of anesthesia dolorosa. I had a patient who made a wrong decision, decided she was terrified of having a microvascular decompression, opted for a radiofrequency thermocoagulation, developed anesthesia dolorosa, and I'm still managing her anesthesia dolorosa 20 years on. So very important that patients have really weighed up the risks and hence the importance of your papers and how you report your results because that's what patients that's what we're reading when we give our patients advice about which surgical options how many are likely to get anesthesia dolorosa how many are likely to get sensory change how frequent is that sensory change how long will it persist what about hearing loss how important is this Again, when I was at a patient support group in, in the States with Janetta being present, the first time I met Peter Janetta, a patient stood up and said to, to Peter, said, you know, you did a fantastic operation. I'm totally pain free off medication, but I've actually lost my job. Why? Because she lost her hearing and she was a principal violinist. Uh, in an orchestra. So that's what is so important about measuring outcomes, asking patients for their personal outcomes and what is important to them, because that's going to affect them long term. So what decisions do patients make? Well, many years ago, as you see, in 2007, we did a theoretical uh, uh, decision analysis, sorry, um, looking at what patients, we gave them various scenarios and we asked them whether they would choose surgery or um, medical management. And medical manage, uh, surgical management predominated. So the choice that patients made, their first choice was in fact a microvascular decompression. And then fewer patients, the last choice was actually medical management. Now, we've just done a, an evaluation of 11 years of our MDT clinic, which is where um, Nana helped us as an independent observer and another medical student as independent observers, looking at outcomes from our 11 years of over 300, 340 patients nearly in this group. And interestingly, what we found was 50% of our patients opted to have surgery, but 50% remained on medical management. And they were both in both groups reasonably happy with their global improvement uh, of change. So we need to be open to the fact that not all patients want surgery, but you can get better results on surgical management. What we have done is run a pain management program using the normal scheme that's used by psychologists and physiotherapists, but we run it just for patients with trigeminal neuralgia. Now, all the first uh, factors, uh, apart from meeting fellow sufferers, which proves to be of extreme importance to patients, goal setting patients, all these are very much factors that are done in most pain management programs. But what is crucial is that patients develop a TN attack management plan. So they know now plan A, plan B, plan C. Now, if they've been to an MDT clinic, they have got the contacts for the neurosurgeon. So if their pain becomes unmanageable, they initially decided on medical management, they can contact the neurosurgeons and get admitted pretty quickly because we've got several neurosurgeons and the surgery can be completed fairly quickly. What we have found is that mindfulness, meditation is very important in reducing fear of an attack because fear, as I've mentioned before, drives a lot of pain and the ability to meet other fellow sufferers. The lack of, they feel very isolated that they've got nobody to talk to and suddenly they meet each other. And even though I have seen hundreds of patients with TN, they will always turn around to me and say, but you don't know what it feels like. So talking to what we call a buddy, that is a fellow sufferer, is of crucial importance to patients. And this has enabled them to develop that. And again, we've published that uh, data. We also have a clinical nurse specialist 
who also offers appointments for drug management, who's excellent, who knows her drugs very well, and will guide through patients for their medical management. And then if they fail, suggest and contact the neurosurgeons on their behalf. So patients feel that they have a package of care that involves a multidisciplinary team. Uh, and then we also refer them to patient support groups. There is one in the US, which was the first one to be set up. Canada, Australia, Denmark have got one. I think uh, Rome, uh, Italians are trying to set one up. And we obviously have one in the UK. So one of the other things that we are looking at, which we also need to look at, we looked at with a couple of Chinese students as well, was the economic costs. Uh, and we've still got to do some work around this. But again, it could be that surgery is more economic because of all these factors. But we need to look at this still in greater detail. So in conclusion, this is the multidisciplinary pain pathway that we have developed and we are trying to uh, advertise nationally and internationally. We've proven each step of it. We've had independent observers. Uh, we've had medical students. We've had neurosurgeons from elsewhere to assess the pathway so that we're not biased here. Um, so patients are carefully phenotyped, fill out patient-related outcome measures, have MRIs, start on drug management, joint neurosurgical clinic, and then they can go whichever way is necessary, as I've outlined uh, already. Um, and as Nana has <coughs> advertised, we have just published our new book, um, which has got over 30 contributors ranging from patients to psychologists, to neurosurgeons, uh, physicians, dentists, a full range uh, with CPD uh, there, lay summaries for patients, plenty of uh, case scenarios, so an easy book uh, to refer to. Um, and if you use the promotion code, you can get it cheaper. It's also available on Kindle. So I hope I've covered for you epidemiology, classification, uh, some of the key features and the importance of those and measuring impact outcomes, which we hope we will publish shortly so that you know which outcomes should be used and which measures might be useful, some of the latest guidelines and the importance of involving patients in any perspective in deciding on pain management. So thank you very much for listening and giving me the opportunity to talk to a, a wide range of uh, neurosurgeons. Um, and I hope uh, that you will use some of this data in being able to manage your patients even better uh, than currently. So I'm open to any questions there. So I'll stop sharing. So many thanks for your wonderful lecture. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask a few questions and then I will let the participants to ask um, the questions by themselves. Uh, so first of all, um, you whatever the chart you, which you showed like three slides ago, uh, I mean, uh, there was a mm -hmm. chart, yeah, for neurosurgery uh, in red line, you had a neurosurgery, but before that also, at first uh, I'll ask about the medication. So uh, you highlighted uh, uh, the, uh, your preferences uh, for the medications, but for example, there might be different medications for, example, for background pain, whenever background pain is more dominant. C could you please provide a little bit more details on uh, medications based on type of pain, uh, whenever background pain is more bother bothering or sharp pains, uh, et cetera. So could you please yeah. highlight a little bit? Yes, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, of course, as, as you know, that the oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine, lamotrigine are really for sharp shooting pain uh, and don't cover the background pain. But drugs uh, such as pregabalin and gabapentin are uh, and have been developed for neuropathic pain and could therefore be of value in patients who have more of the background pain. So those are the ones that we would use. We are now in the UK at least slightly more restricted with their use because they've become labeled as controlled drugs. 
Um, so it's a bit harder to um, administer these uh, or, or prescribe these drugs. The other drug for the background pain that I will use if it's a prominent one is amitriptyline because that's again a well-recognized drug uh, for use in neuropathic uh, pain. Um, and so those are the options I would say uh, that I would use. Uh, okay, thanks for clarifying. And uh, I, I kind of have a similar question regarding the sur uh, I mean, surgical options. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, as far as I know from your patients, you offer, uh, in addition to tr um, microscopic decompression, you offer several other uh, treatments like uh, uh, so about, uh, not ballooning, but uh, a glycerol injection, you use uh, uh, also radio frequency and uh, gamma knife uh, and also a uh, combing technique whenever there is uh, no obvious uh, radiological findings. And I was wondering, uh, you also attending uh, the lecture from uh, prof by Professor Mojgan Hode and she kind of highlighted uh, the different uh, surgical, uh, I mean, this, this surgical decision-making. I mean, she was deciding surgery based on the zones of uh, uh, compression, uh, which I have not seen elsewhere. I was wondering, uh, if, as far as I know, in UCL, it's more like patient decides, uh, uh, patient is given option and then makes decision. I was wondering how, um, or if it changed, uh, because I was there in 2019. Uh, how is it now? How does it work now? Yeah, mostly we stay with those. Um, I think what is important is that you have a range of options. The only one we don't do because none of them have had experience is balloon compression, but otherwise we do offer uh, the range. And yes, we do um, a little bit of more guidance towards patients. So if we feel that they have really got a very clear neurovascular compression, we do offer um, more sort of uh, advice about opting for a microvascular decompression. The problem is that sometimes patients are terrified of having these procedures uh, because it's billed as a big uh, operation. And so again, it's about the way you present um, the procedure that's important. But I think uh, as we heard uh, the last uh, uh, one that I attended, um, better imaging might be the answer in the mm. future. And uh, I think that's something uh, we've just got a small study that we've done in 10 patients uh, on uh, very um, detailed DTI. And we're looking to review those because those could help to guide us as to where is the disability? Because we all know that, for instance, a certain percentage of patients, even in the perfect case, fail with microvascular decompression. So the mechanism must be different. Is it a sodium channel problem? Uh, and is it more of a central or a peripheral problem? So I think imaging is a way forward for us to be able to identify a little bit more clearly which treatment modality could be sort of um, advised uh, to patients. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, the, uh, this ballooning is one, uh, one of the surgeries, which is um, actually the only uh, surgical option which is not offered inside UCLH. But uh, I would also like to highlight that UCLH offers uh, surgery for uh, cluster headache, uh, so, which is uh, actually the only center with the largest uh, data and uh, most experience in cluster headache surgical management. And uh, for trigeminal neurology, it's kind of, um, I, I mean, though the, those cluster headache and trigeminal neurology are kind of different uh, entities, they still have some cross uh, crossover. And what, uh, I mean, do you have experience, uh, as far as I know, during my stay in uh, UCL, uh, Professor Zrinzo performed one surgery uh, for uh, trigeminal neuralgia cluster headache uh, girl, student girl. And I was wondering if you uh, performed that uh, DBS, if you uh, uh, consider DBS uh, uh, for a cluster headache uh, as an option uh, for mm. the treatment of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Yeah, for cluster headache, I think it is a different animal. I think there is a different etiology. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, but there are patients who can have a mixture of both and therefore the dilemma of treatment. But this is a very rare group. I think the group that, um, and uh, 
the uh, headache group have just published uh, in Brain, in fact, is the Sunna and the Sunks, which I didn't refer to, those with autonomic features and potentially that those patients should only undergo microvascular decompression rather than any of the other ablative procedures. But I think neuromodulation, deep brain uh, stimulation may be things of the future, but I think those have got to be guided by improved imaging. And I think imaging is the key uh, to other uh, surgical options. Yeah, I agree with that. And that um, patient which I remember was uh, in, uh, in UCLA, Queen Square. So that girl had obvious compression uh, with the neuroimaging and uh, Professor Srinso performed uh, a decompression and it was obviously decompressed on imaging, but she, she still had some problems and then he, he performed DPS. So that uh, was the kind of rare case which uh, I was able to see there. And I guess it might... Uh, continue to performing DPS for those patients. Okay, I will um, go to uh, try some uh, questions from the chat section. Uh, so uh, the first question is, uh, Dr. Engin Duz, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly. Uh, so dear professor, what are your thoughts on adaptive neuromodulatory therapies for the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, and can it uh, be among uh, uh, the treatment options so uh, the question is for, about uh, adaptive neuromodulatory therapies for the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. I haven't had any experience, but I think from what we see from the world of neuromodulation, it might be a way forward. But I think, again, here we, you know, we really need to have good outcome measures. They need to be properly phenotyped so we know who we're dealing with, baseline outcome measures, and then potentially have tried other treatments first, because we do know that surgery, particularly microvascular decompression, works so effectively. Um, and I think that's the dilemma, that we have got good treatments for particularly the classical TNs. But I think there is a role and we need to explore it, but we need to use good outcome measures uh, that we start with measuring baselines and then look at the outcomes. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, the uh, the next question is about glycerol injection. Uh, they are wondering what is your what are your thoughts about that for glycerol injections? Yeah, I think they work very well. We do a lot of them. Um, one of our retired neurosurgeons was an addict uh, related to glycerol. He only did glycerols. I saw patients who'd had up to eight glycerol. Uh, um, injections done surprisingly with no anesthesia dolorosa, uh, but with decreasing uh, improvement. So I think uh, they do work, they're useful. Um, and in patients, particularly with medical morbidities, it's a useful procedure uh, to do. Yeah, no. so and the same person also adds a comment, especially uh, Dr. Ahmed Najjar uh, adds a comment, especially in the resource of uh, resource limiting settings. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, what are your uh, so, Doctor? Um, wait, the sort of private messages. Uh, um, okay, uh, Doctor Selkor. Pecker, uh, the reason for trigeminal neuralgia in a patient with vascular compression is accepted as having demyelinization in that compress, uh, compression area. How uh, the pain disappears uh, on the day of surgery? Uh, does demyelinating area heals immediately? And uh, what is the natural um, what is the natural course of this disease? Right. Well, this is always the dilemma uh, that we ask. Why do patients wake up pain free? Well, I think one of them is because you're decompressing and the nerve fibers are no longer in such close contact because it isn't just about demyelination, but it's also about the contact. Uh, and so if you're separating out your fibers and they're not in as close a contact, that may also be a reason for it. But this is the big question. Uh, why does it work so effectively, so quickly? And particularly when you're doing uh, the ablative procedures at the Gasserian ganglion level, you're not decompressing the nerve. And yet, apart from gamma knife, they all wake up and tell you they're virtually pain-free or pain-free within a week or two. Is it that there is a second 
or even not even a second, but even a third mechanism. Uh, we do know that it's the sodium channels are affected, that they're not at go as good at um, inhibiting uh, impulses. And could it be that some form of intervention results in affecting the sodium channels as well, or even other reasons for it, which we still haven't got to the bottom of? Okay, so uh, the uh, same person also further clarifies the question, uh, what is the natural course of trigeminal neuralgia in a young patient who had no treatment? Yeah, uh, the young, uh, younger patients are a dilemma because they don't have as good an outcome. And Kim Birchall particularly has been looking at that group um, of the younger patients. Um, they're possibly also surgically more difficult because there's less space available. But again, is there a different mechanism? And the problem is that we still lack good data on remission relapse periods because none of us, apart from possibly in, in China, have large enough series of patients to be able to make some of these uh, predictors. And my uh, goal would be to have, and I'm trying to work with uh, a group in Stanford, is to have a registry where we have very carefully phenotyped patients um, mm. with outcome measures and look at them over time and see whether there we can start to predict and, and include all patients, those who remain on medical management and those who um, have surgical outcomes that we do keep a registry of them. And perhaps if we have thousands of patients in there, we may be able to start to separate them out and look for predictors um, and look at why younger patients don't seem to do as well as older patients. And is hypertension another feature because the disease is highest in the 50 to 60 year olds when hypertension becomes an issue? Are the vessels more convoluted? Um, do the younger patients perhaps have uh, already early hypertension uh, that could account for it? So I think until we have very large registries uh, with carefully phenotyped patients, we're, we're going to struggle with answering that question. And why do 50% of our patients not need surgery and manage? It's another dilemma. Nana. Thank uh, you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Professor Selçuk Peker, the, the one asking the question, has a uh, good experience on treating trigeminal neuralgia by gamma knife. And I want to hear his opinions. Okay. If he is able to. Professor, okay, you can turn on your microphone. I think it's okay, yes. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Dr. Zakrzewska is a uh, legend in this subject, trigeminal neuralgia. So it is very nice for us to have her here in our homes in our comfortable uh, area. So it was very nice to hear his, uh, sorry, her uh, lecture uh, this evening. Uh, of course, uh, I want to add a little bit to the first question as an answer. My opinion is the reason for trigeminal microvascular decompression surgery works on trigeminal neuralgia patients is not because of decompression of the nerve, I think it is because of the compression and the kicking of the nerve, the compression of the nerve, uh, washing with the water of the nerve, etc. So it's a, I think it's a kind of trauma to the nerve. It causes uh, pain relief. And to do a trauma, which is very close to pons, it's better for the patient. If a patient has a large vascular loop compressing the trigeminal nerve, you have to work a lot on that area. So it means that these patients have most good, uh, most nice follow-up after the surgery. If a patient has no vascular compression there, a slight vein, for example, the uh, follow-up in these patients are not very nice. So I think the reason is that. The other question you asked that 
how what I I do think about gamma necrotic surgery. I think if a patient is if a patient can be operated and she or he wants to be operated, the uh, surgical uh, choice should be MVD, microvas microvascular decompression. But if a patient has uh, some problems and or she or he doesn't want to have surgery, uh, percutaneous techniques or gamma knife can be done. But of course, all of us know that the recurrence rate of uh, gamma knife patients is much more than the other ones. We should know that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there was a question about the Dominax. So I guess uh, um, if it is comparable yeah. to MVD, so I guess I want to ask this question. It's yeah, I, I, I don't test. think gamma knife outcomes are quite comparable to MVD, uh, but they are very good. And again, it seems to be technique sensitive because if we look at the data coming out from France, the data is much better than, for instance, our data is not quite as good uh, at UCLH, although, again, we don't do such large numbers uh, of it. So I think it is a, a technique sensitive uh, as well, but it's a very good technique for patients who have significant medical morbidity and who are not in extremis because we have to accept that the gamma knife doesn't work immediately. And so if you've got patients with really acute pain, I think it potentially is not fair to offer them that because you don't know it could take up to six months for gamma knife uh, uh, to work. But I think it is good to have it in your armamentarium and have it as another option. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so um, as a next question, I would like to ask, how do you think uh, the, uh, this MDT can work in terms of developing countries? And uh, also for the surgical options, like uh, um, for macrovascular decompression, uh, for example, um, Professor Zrinzo is uh, performing uh, the Teflon pad, not in between, but you know, he's uh, uh, using glue to attach the tentorium. And uh, when uh, I was attending his uh, surgery, he performed, uh, he reoperated uh, on a patient who had a Teflon granuloma developed from previous surgery elsewhere. And uh, when I saw this different technique for the first time, uh, I asked uh, to my uh, supervisor of uh, our near surgical training program in Georgia, and uh, he said that the price of this uh, globe, for example, is uh, so expensive and compared to the uh, to our prices of, I mean, it was almost a one third or one half of the price of a surgical procedure. So, and this was one of the reason why we uh, are, are not uh, uh, performing this, uh, at, uh, I mean, uh, this kind of uh, surgery. We are just um, using Teflon pad in between, which is an auto technique and uh, also uh, sometimes uh, there are branches as uh, he explained uh, coming from the artery which uh, does not uh, uh, I mean limits the mobility and it cannot be put away uh, so uh, there are several aspects for developing countries and uh, I, I was wondering how do you think uh, I mean we whatever you present is the best scenario but uh, how do you think it can be used for developing countries or for example how uh, does it work uh, in Poland, which is much better in situation in, in, uh, compared to Georgia, but how does it work in other countries? As far as I know, you have lots of international experience. Yes, I think you're right. It's, a, it's an expensive operation, uh, MVD, and uh, therefore more difficult to perform in developing countries. And I think the important thing is to really look at um, the techniques, I think, from the Chinese, as we saw on that talk. Uh, there is the neurosurgeon with 4,000 uh, microvascular decompressions to his name. And I think it's looking at their techniques. And I think the techniques keep changing and people are adapting it. Uh, our neurosurgeons now decide he's going to use glue instead of Teflon uh, because that might be less uh, because of that Teflon uh, granuloma he had. Um, so I think one has to adapt that. But I think it is worth uh, countries uh, having uh, one expert. I think patients are prepared to travel uh, further and it would be worth uh, countries having um, a team of a physician 
and a neurosurgeon and perhaps only one in the country if it is possible but i don't know enough about it but i know that for instance the ablative procedures in india uh, are much cheaper and easier to do obviously um, than the big microvascular decompression and given the results that we can get pain free on those i think in those countries it's worth doing those techniques because i think Overall, probably the ablative procedures still on average do better than those on medical management, because again, the drugs can be expensive. And who should be making the decision? I mean, you, you have some specialty training and expertise in this field, but uh, for average size countries, who should be making the decision? Is there, should it be neurologist? Is it okay for the neurologist to handle the entire treatment? Or do you think that uh, that needs definitely this subspecialty training is compulsory. I mean, how do you think? Well, well, I think there is a need for more training among the neurologists. The neurologists are very reluctant to refer patients. They still have this old fashioned view that patients have got to use X number of drugs before they can have surgery. Um, and I'm still trying to get the neuros neurologists to understand that patients should have an earlier option of a surgical option. And therefore, I think a well-trained neurosurgeon potentially with posterior fossa uh, surgery experience is probably should be the lead. But again, making sure that they know how to phenotype their patients. So I think it's probably better for a neurosurgeon to be running such a service in the developing countries because the neurologists are very busy with migraine at the moment, as you all know, um, and they're not very good with uh, recommending surgical options for TN patients. Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the neurosurgeon from Georgia, Dr. Vladimir Tsikarishvili. Uh, as far as I know, he has the, um, he's the most experienced in my country in terms of uh, surgical treatments of trigeminal neurology. And um, maybe he would like to ask a few questions in person. Uh, can you please unmute the microphone? Okay. Uh, thank you. Do you listen to me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to allow me in this good uh, lecture. I'd like to thank uh, Professor. It's very nice, very excellent lecture. And I have a, uh, a very short question. In the typical three general neurology, in most of the cases, there is clear indication to go the patient to the surgery. But, uh, um, more important and more difficult cases when there is idiopathic the geminal neurology. So atypical uh, to geminal neurology. Is there any surgical uh, options? Your recommendations? Well, I think, uh, yes, I think there are some, but I think one has to, again, be very careful about taking the history. And I think as Nana alluded to, what is the worst pain? Which is the pain that bothers the most? And I think the important thing then to say to them is, right, so you've drawn your diagram and you've shown these are your big flare ups. These are your intense pain. And here's your background pain. How bad is this background pain? And if I do surgery, what would happen if I don't change your background pain? Could you live with the background pain alone? Uh, because sometimes that background pain, if it's very high, I start to think, well, I don't know if surgery is the option for them. Whereas if the background pain is low intensity, two, three, uh, and they say they can live with that, then I think it's worth proceeding with, uh, with surgery. But it is, again, on an individual basis. But it is about, again, phenotyping very carefully. Uh, have these patients really got trigeminal neuralgia or is it a neuropathic pain related to potentially some surgical treatment in the past, particularly dental treatment in the past or trauma to the face? So getting the story becomes very, very important in these more complex, as we call them, these patients with concomitant pain. Because I have a, a theory, not just myself, but I've seen others mention it as well. If you think about it, that when patients have very severe pain. They don't want to move that side of their face. So they're not using their muscles of mastication at the same level as they're using them on the other side. 
And therefore, perhaps some of the pain, the background pain, is a musculoskeletal pain related to not using their mouth uh, evenly. And that could be playing a role in some of these background pains. But it's very difficult. You can, one can spend a lot of time talking to patients to try and work out what is the pain exactly, this background pain, how much it interferes with quality of life, and is there a muscular element? So testing the face by pressing on the masseter muscles and the temporalis muscle and seeing if you elicit some tenderness could be a guide to working out whether there is an element of musculoskeletal pain there. And another question, if there is no neurovascular uh, complex in the MRI scan, what is your recommendation? What kind of surgical procedures do you recommend? If well, I no think neurovascular conflict, yeah. but that is you're talking about no neurovascular uh, conflict on MRI scan. Yeah, because the MRI scans may miss it or may not be. And, and I think we see in the literature that isn't always perfect. Uh, the, the sensitivity and specificity of the current MRIs is not always perfect. So it could be that there still is something. And as Kim Birchall has uh, published, but others have, is there a scope also for neurolysis or uh, internal neurolysis? Uh, slightly, and you're going to be more familiar than me about this gentle combing of the nerves or disturbing the nerve. When I looked at a large series of um, partial sensory rhizotomy, which none of you perform these days, but we did show that these patients had good pain relief, but the risk of sensory change and anesthesia dolorosa was greatly increased because, of course, you're touching that nerve and doing something to the nerve. So in some cases, there still is a, a, a potential role for an MVD or a posterior fossa surgery. Uh, rather than going for an ablative procedure. But again, we don't know. Is it worth trying an ablative procedure first? If you don't get a good result, do you then go and do posterior fossa surgery? And again, the numbers, at least outside China, are not big enough to be able to really say what should we be doing. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Um I will also add a comment. Uh, so Professor Zrinzo is um, actually um, performing this combing technique, which is, um, I'm pretty sure you are familiar with it. It is separating this fibers so that it's re reducing the transmi transmission between the fibers. And I also asked the same question to Professor Mojgan Hode from Toronto Hospital. And um, uh, she clarified uh, uh, the surgical techniques based on the level of compression. And I also asked her the same question, what if there is no compression at all. And she also said the same that uh, in this that rare cases, she performs um, internal neurolysis and uh, combat technique is uh, widely accepted, uh, accepted as far as I see. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other questions, Dr. Sikari Shirley? Oh, it's enough. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in the chat section, I see um, uh, Dr. Nurula Kosman, he, he's saying, thank you, Professor. It was a great lecture from Izmir Hospital. Uh, there are some thank you notes, uh, and uh, I think that's it. And as a last question, I would like to hear from you. What do you think is uh, the future of uh, uh, trigeminal neurology treatment, what, what do you think the, uh, your uh, personal or general research should be focused on more radiological or uh, new medications or newer techniques? And uh, for example, you had a uh, research for new medications or sodium channel blockers. So what, what is your, the perspective in the near future? What do you think? Well, I do. I mean, although I'm keen to develop a new medication because there's an immediate need for it, but I think we still need to understand the disease much more. It's such a fascinating uh, disorder um, and that we need good registries of phenotype and surgical techniques to be able to answer some of them. And I think imaging is going to be potentially our biological marker in the future. Um, and there is a genetic component, and we've been doing some work with in the States uh, as well about looking at genetic potential, and that could also 
play a role uh, in the future. So I think uh, very much more understanding the disease more because it's such a specific disease is the way forward. Yes, I will use new drugs and, and um, there is potential for them, but I think it's understanding the mechanism and the pathophysiology uh, that will drive uh, future treatments. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have any more questions, so I guess uh, also it's time to finish the lecture. Perfect timing, 90 minutes exactly. So thank you uh, once again for accepting our invitation and uh, many thanks for sharing your uh, thoughts and uh, what this wonderful lecture to uh, all of us. And that's it. Dr. Suju, is there anything you would like to add? I want to thank uh, Dr. Zakreska. It's always hard to pronounce. Her that's why they all know me as Zach. All my <laughs> patients know me as Zach. <laughs> Zach, OK. <laughs> I want to thank you again. And I want to remember, uh, I want to, our uh, conferences will continue. And then tomorrow, Atul Goel will talk. I will accept, uh, I will uh, be, and I am expecting you to attend again. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Dr. you, and Sig thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all and have a, a such a broad audience. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You